So welcome everybody. On behalf of Dr. Kelly Metcalf and the Peter Gilgan Center here at Women's College Hospital, I'm very happy today to introduce our two panelists, Dr. Karen Glass and Angelia, Angelina Tryon. So for many of you that are Women's College patients, you may already know Angelina, and she's our certified genetic counselor working at our hereditary cancer clinic here at Women's College Hospital. She is also the study coordinator and genetic counselor for the SCREEN project, a Canadian national initiative to make hereditary cancer testing available to Canadians at an accessible price. She received her master's of science in human genetics from Sarah Lawrence College in 2018 and has been working in the hereditary cancer genetic space ever since. Dr. Karen Glass received her undergraduate training at the University of Western Ontario and her medical degree at the University of Ottawa. She then completed her postgraduate training in obstetrics and gynecology at McMaster University and a two-year fellowship at UCLA in the, with a dual appointment in the divisions of Repro reproductive endocrinology, lots of syllables for a Friday, I'm sorry, and infertility. <laughs> Subsequently, she joined Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center and Women's College Hospital, where she concentrates on female cancer patients. She later joined the Create Fertility Center and is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. She sees female cancer patients from all over Southern Ontario who are consulted with regards to help regarding fertility preservation after a cancer diagnosis. So thank you for being here. And so today's session is a little bit different. Dr. Kelly Metcalf and I will be navigating some of the questions that were sent to us earlier in the week, as well as some questions that we have come up with or that we've consolidated throughout the few sessions that we've had this year. And we'll just take turns flipping between Dr. Glass and Angelina, and we're hoping to address a lot of your questions. But if you have any questions right now, feel free to put them in the Q&A section. Um, Dr. Metcalf, anything I might have missed? before we nope, start. I think that's it. Uh, um, I think we're ready to go with some of the questions. So please, as we go along, if there's something that you want to know a little bit more about, just put it into the Q&A and Dr. Kutsopoulos and I will ask those questions of our panelists um, because this is really your opportunity to get some answers from the experts in the area. And we're very thrilled that they're here to help answer some of our questions today. So please put your Q&A in. Um, nobody will know what question you're asking. We're not gonna name anybody's name. We will just ask this in general, okay? So Dr. Glass, I'm gonna start with you because today we're really focusing on women, perhaps men, younger, who have been identified with a genetic predisposition to developing cancer. This could be either BRCA1, BRCA2, but we're testing a lot of other genes now as well. So for some people who find this out before they elect to have children, is there something they can do? People often ask, how do I, is there any way I can ensure I don't pass this genetic mutation onto my children? So can you just walk us through what some of the options might be for people if this is a consideration for them? You're on mute. There you go. Uh, so it's always a very uh, challenging decision and a very personal decision to make, but especially if people have seen family members pass away at a young age from cancer, they are hoping that they would not pass that on to their children and would not have their children go through what they saw either themselves or a family member go through. And so when they have a referral to a fertility clinic, someone such as myself will talk to them about the option and whether it's the male partner or the female partner they carries the gene mutation, they have the option to do in vitro fertilization or test two babies and um, find out which embryos carry the mutation and then only do an embryo transfer of the embryos that don't carry the mutation. Um, and so that is unfortunately a process that is costly. In Ontario, when you're ready to have children, you have one cycle of IVF, which will be funded by Ontario's government as long as you have OHEP, as long as the female partner has OHEP. 
And so that cycle of going through and taking out the eggs and mixing the eggs with the sperm and making an embryo and growing an embryo in the laboratory and freezing the embryo and later transferring the embryos back to have a baby, that's all covered by OHIP, which is amazing. But unfortunately, the Ministry of Health and OHIP don't feel that it is yet their responsibility to pay for testing of any genetic mutation. So whether it would be cystic fibrosis or um, alpha-1 antitrypsin or BRCA, any genetic testing of any patient of any disorder is not covered by OHIP. And so the price of that additional cost to do the IVF would depend on what clinic you go to. Um, and so here at CREATE, we've developed our own lab, which is in-house, and that's enabled patients to save money. Um, there's no shipping fee. Um, it's not in American dollars, which is where we used to more than 10 years ago send embryos. And so the fee to do genetic testing for one round here at CREATE in our lab is a total of $8,000. And so that's gonna test the embryos to look for things like Down syndrome, because I wouldn't wanna put in an embryo that didn't have BRCA, but did have Down syndrome. That would obviously defeat the purpose. And so we will test for the genes for things like Down syndrome and make sure the embryo is otherwise genetically normal. And then we will do the additional testing for the BRCA mutation. So the general testing that lots of patients do just because they're over 35, that's $4,000. And then the extra part to test for a BRCA type mutation is an additional $4,000. So, um, so the total cost for that additional testing is $8,000. And one of the things I always talk to patients about is there's no guarantee that I'll find a perfect embryo. So I've had patients that have had eight embryos and seven of them had BRCA. So when we flip the coin, imagine if you were like just playing games with your at home and flipping pennies over, you could get heads seven times in a row. And so unfortunately, there's patients who've had bad luck where seven out of eight of their embryos had BRCA and the one embryo that didn't have BRCA had something like Down syndrome and wasn't genetically. So there's a lot of gambling that happens when we do that. And it's actually pretty rare to not find any embryos that are perfect. We usually find some, but sometimes we're disappointed when we do that testing. And so um, when we find that, you know, one of the things is in people that have diseases that seem to um, affect more a female gender versus a male gender, this is one of the situations that the government does allow us to gender select. So if a patient had only embryos that were genetically normal that did not have the mutation and they had embryos that were, for instance, for BRCA male but had the mutation, I have had patients decide that they could live with that burden and that they would go ahead and transfer that embryo. So we can end up with some really complicated situations um, and you know, have some long conversations when people are trying to decide how they would like to proceed in these situations. But most of the time we find a couple of perfect embryos and then we can go ahead and transfer them and they will have a baby. When we're transferring embryos that don't have BRCA, we are not allowed in Canada to reveal gender. So you can't select the gender of your children in Canada. That's not allowed. Only in this situation if we did not have an embryo uh, that was unaffected by the mutation. Okay. So Dr. Glass, if someone was interested in exploring this option, they can go to one of these clinics and have these kind of discussions. Maybe there's some counseling associated with it because it does sound like it's a very difficult decision and it's not straightforward. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that I say it's a great idea for patients to be referred to a fertility clinic is something that Dr. Metcalf and I are currently deep in the middle of, which is looking at ovarian reserve in patients of mutation um, who carry uh, these mutations. So um, the data that's out there at this point does indicate that unfortunately it does seem that patients with these kind of mutations like BRCA1 and 2 likely have uh, lower ovarian reserve, meaning they have less eggs than a patient that doesn't have that mutation. 
And so that means that they may get in trouble with fertility younger um, and have less results from an IVF cycle than someone who doesn't have that mutation. So they may say like, I'm working on my career, I'm not ready to have children, but I do want to talk about this. So they should really go and talk about it as young an age as possible. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One is that they may have the lower ovarian reserve, but the second reason is that um, the younger your eggs, the better the quality of the eggs, so that when we do an IVF cycle to look for the BRCA gene, more of the embryos will be the kind that are perfect that we would be able to transfer. So that better success. Good. Okay. Thank you for raising that. I think there's a lot of different issues that women, men, and this isn't just for a, a woman who has a BRCA1 or 2 or whatever mutation. This also is for the men as well. Um, because they're just as likely to pass down a genetic mutation as the mom is, the dad is just as likely. Exactly. And so maybe, you know, the wife is feeling like this is a burden on me. I'm the one who has to go through this. And so they're going to have to have a discussion. And this is going to be an important emotional discussion. If it's, you know, if she feels like I really don't want my children to have this mutation, I'm going to have to go through a process. And, you know, what does that process entail? And how, you know, how am I going to feel doing this? And what are the effects on me to go through an IVF cycle to help my children with this mutation. And it, it takes about two weeks to do an IVF cycle. Um, so patients have to be available. They need to come into the clinic in the mornings to do the monitoring of their eggs growing. And usually they have to come in about five times over the two week period. Um, and then they'll be taking the fertility drugs. So fertility drugs sometimes are pills. Um, so we do use for our BRCA female carriers during IVF a pill called letrozole. And so that pill will keep their estrogen level lower and in a nice controlled range, which we feel is safer for someone with that kind of a mutation. And then they'll also be taking injections. So women who go through IVF are just like women who have diabetes and need to do a needle of insulin. They're going to be doing a needle in their tummy of the fertility drugs each day. So mm. you'll be on these drugs for about 10, 11 days and then have a small procedure in the retrieval, uh, the retrieval procedure in the office under sedation when the eggs are ready and when they're ripe and when we're taking them out. So that whole, that's IVF is something to go through and people will have to make decisions about their own bodies and if it's something they're comfortable going through. Okay. Thanks. That's helpful. A lot to consider for people. Thank but you. It's great that there are clinics like yours that are, are there to support women and men in making their decisions. So we'll give Dr. Glass a little break and we'll switch gears and we'll talk to Angelina, our genetic counselor. And since we're talking about cre procreation and, and children, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, how you counsel patients who are considering disclosing the results to their children, what age is this recommended at, what is the process, what should we tell children, and just a little bit about your experience in the clinic dealing with passing on this information. Yeah, it, it can be tricky oftentimes for a lot of families because I definitely have had parents who aren't sure you know, how young to be informing their children about, you know, the possibility that they could inherit something like this, or, you know, do I tell them right when they turn 30, you know, should I kind of let them live their life and, you know, enjoy their childhood and their teen and young adult years um, without having to think about, you know, their potential risk for cancer. And honestly, it, it, it differs from family to family, and it can differ from child to child. Not only do we have to consider the ages of the children, but also the maturity level, um, their ability to kind of take in and process this information um, should be taken into account too. Generally, when we're thinking of testing children, or I should say testing offspring, <laughs> we typically are not testing children. So we're waiting till they're at least 18 years old, they're an adult, they can decide for themselves whether they want to know this information or not. Um, in very rare instances, we may consider testing a very mature 17 year old. Um, so generally, you know, it's not something that people need to be concerned about for their very young children. Um, but I think it can be helpful to at least start talking about this in, in the teen years or even late teens 
um, when they're kind of getting closer to 18 or young adulthood, um, when you know the possibility of having this type of, of appointment is an option for them. Um, and a common question that I get from people is, you know, how do I broach the subject of genetics? And an interesting piece of advice that I heard from someone several years ago is how would you broach an important discussion of, of any other topic with your child? You know, how did you broach your cancer diagnosis if you had a cancer diagnosis? Or if there was, you know, a major event in the family, like a death in the family, how would you talk about that topic with your children? It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a, a sad event, but any type of major news that you had to share um, you can consider taking a similar type of approach and, you know, try not to disclose this information too young. I mean, there's no reason for a seven-year-old to know that she might be at risk of getting breast cancer when she's 30 or 40. Um, but particularly, you know, in the high school years when kids are taking biology class, you know, they can start to understand this information. Um, and it can be a discussion that's had over the course of time. So it, it doesn't need to be, you know, all at once. You can go little by little as time goes by. And, you know, ultimately if there are any science related questions, we are happy to talk to, you know, your young adults and provide them with that information. Um, so try not to get bogged down in, in the science and, and the small details. And so if you are counseling, the younger populations with someone in their 18, is around 18 or 20, do you approach the counseling session the same? Is the, the, because being tested for a mutation in one of these genes comes with a lot of information, which might be hard to even wrap your head around when you're 18. And so do you go through the whole um, prevention? Oh, well, let's think about, I guess we should take the perspective of a female mutation carrier. And so at the counseling session, is it, is it as in-depth as, as if you were counseling perhaps a 40-year-old woman? That's a good question. Um, again, it can depend on the maturity and the understanding of the specific individual that I'm speaking with, but I tend to treat appointments with younger uh, patients, let's say an 18-year-old, as more of an information gathering experience um, and more of just an FYI, this is something that could be coming in the future. And I would say people that are getting closer to the age where screening might begin are, are more keen to learn about those types of things. Whereas at 18 years old, we like to emphasize, you know, even if you did decide to pursue with testing at this point in time, it's not gonna change anything for you for the next, you know, five, 10 plus years. Um, and oftentimes when people hear that, it makes them a little bit more comfortable in knowing they don't necessarily have to make a decision right away. They can kind of let it marinate for a few years or a few months, or, you know, I do have every once in a while, someone who is that young and is very keen to know because they've been hearing about this from their family for the last several years. So um, for younger people, it's definitely more of just an information giving session, discussing the option of testing. And at least now we have, I know a lot of resources available on how to talk to your family members. I know we've developed one at Women's College Hospital on our website. And so I think there's a lot of more information available to help people understand the idea of genetics and genetic testing and how to talk to your, your relatives. So thank you, Angelina. Angelina, can I just add one thing? Because it's just striking me about a patient that we saw this week. And it's really important to know the ages of onset of breast cancer in your family. So if you have someone with a diagnosis of breast cancer in their early 20s, it, it, it does change the decision-making about when you might wanna tell your relatives or your children. Because we need to think about that earliest age of onset of breast cancer in your family in terms of you know, when others in the family may be experiencing that increased cancer risk. So just for people to be aware of is to think about what ages those cancers were. Would you agree? Definitely, because I think I know the, the instance that you're talking about, yeah. you know, unfortunately there was a young 24, 25 year old who yeah. 
wasn't aware of this mutation in the family and got a young diagnosis of breast cancer and, you know, ended up finding out that, you know, an aunt also was also diagnosed with breast cancer in the 20s. So maybe if she had been aware of that, she would have been tested sooner. Yeah. So, um, so there's all these different independent. combination, just like Dr. Glass has talked about. It, every family is just so unique and it's really an important and that's why we have such amazing genetic counselors to help you navigate these decisions and big, big conversations that you need to have with your family. So uh, revisit your genetic counselor if you need to. We also have social work available at Women's College for patients who are making these kinds of difficult decisions. Unfortunately, Emma, our social worker, couldn't be with us today. She had a family emergency. So, um, but if there are those kind of questions, please know that you can reach out to Emma as well. So Dr. Glass, I'm going to come back to you because we see many women at the time of breast cancer diagnosis. And these women may be younger, they may be older, but when we're thinking about the younger woman, they're often thinking about fertility preservation. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because there may be some women who don't have a partner at the time. Um, what would the options be for that woman? So you've talked a little bit about earlier about creating embryos if you do have a partner. But what about for a woman who's 25, she's just been diagnosed with breast cancer, she wants to think about fertility preservation, but she doesn't have a partner. So can you talk a little bit about that? So for women who do or don't have a partner, OHIP does cover the emergency IVF. So they're going to have a referral from me, usually from their breast cancer medical oncologist or surgeon, and we see them urgently. Um, obviously, they can't wait on the regular waiting list. And uh, we'll see them within a couple days of the referral, and we'll explain to them about IVF. So uh, majority of the young women with breast cancer will receive chemotherapy, and very often that chemotherapy includes a medication called cyclophosphamide. And unfortunately, that cyclophosphamide is very damaging to ovarian reserve. And if everybody kind of remembers biology class, you remember that women are born with all their eggs. May, men, they're making sperm all the time, keeps going. But us girls, we got our eggs and then we just go down, 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 down until we go through menopause. And so getting that batch of chemotherapy for breast cancer will usually um, age the ovary so rapidly that the ovaries at the end of the chemotherapy will be about five to 10 years older than the person's age. So if you get breast cancer at 25, when you're finished your chemotherapy, your ovaries will be like someone who's somewhere between 30 to 35 years old. And then if you have an estrogen receptor positive tumor, your oncology team is going to recommend that you go on the endocrine therapy. And that endocrine therapy, um, you can't get pregnant while you're on it. So because you can't get pregnant, you're just going to be waiting and, you know, there'll be a discussion with the oncology team how long you're going to be on that and how long you have to wait. And so those endocrine therapy medications, they don't damage the ovaries, they don't hurt the eggs that are in there, but you'll be aging and you'll be going through that normal process of your ovarian reserve falling as those years go by. So if you're on that medication and waiting to take a break from it to have a baby for two to five years, um, and then you were some like, say you're 25, so now your ovaries are like a 35 year old, and then you wait two or three more years, now your ovaries are like a 38 year old. So that aging process is gonna be very challenging for people's fertility. Um, and so when we see them and counsel them, we'll do baseline ovarian reserve testing and the most common test that we do other than an ultrasound to see how many little egg follicles are resting on the ovaries is that blood test called AMH or anti-mullerian hormone. And that won't tell me exactly how many eggs you have, but it'll tell me like low, high, medium, very high, and I can figure out where you're going to go with that number. Um, and so then once we have that number, we can have an understanding of uh, what the risks are going to be from that chemotherapy. And then um, the young person with cancer can decide if they'd like to do that IVF cycle. And when we do IVF cycles, uh, whether you have a partner or not, IVF is a bit of a misnomer. So it stands for in vitro fertilization, but we don't have to fertilize those eggs. So if you're a single person, that name is the same thing. We're doing the same thing. It's just the name isn't exactly the right thing. 
So they're going to go through the same thing I talked about earlier. They're going to be on that medication called letrozole to make sure their estrogen stays controlled and low. So in their case, it's going to be very important that I control that estrogen level, especially if they have an estrogen receptor positive tumor. So usually by the end of the 10 days, 11 days of medications, their estrogen is the same as if they had just ovulated. So even though I'm doing IVF and I'm making more eggs, I keep that estrogen level very, very tight with that medication. And so we feel that safe. And there's actually research to show that doing that IVF before the chemotherapy or the surgery um, does not increase the risk of recurrence of their breast cancer. So that's one of the most common questions I get is, could this IVF process make my breast cancer spread? Could it make my disease a higher stage? And from all the research that we've done, it does not, it's safe and it does not cause any problems. And so then they'll go through that same 10, 11 day process of coming in about five times. They'll be on these medications, the pills, the injections. We'll be checking out how the eggs are growing. And once the eggs are ready and we call them ripe, then we'll do the retrieval two days later. And that's the small procedure in the office where we'll sedate them and take out the um, eggs. It takes like 10, 15 minutes. And we call that an egg retrieval. And so that whole process is covered by OHIP, which is an amazing thing that started in 2016. So it's not been forever that we've had that. And so we're really glad that Ontario offers that because it's actually only Ontario and Quebec that offer that. And if you have breast cancer and you're in British Columbia, you would have to pay for your IVF cycle to freeze your eggs. Um, and once those eggs come out, if you don't have a partner, we will just put the egg in the freezer as an egg. And um, for the last, I don't know, about 15 years, we've used a process that's called vitrification. So it's quite safe for an egg and the eggs do really, really well in the liquid nitrogen in the freezer. So one of the other most common questions I get is how long can my eggs stay in the freezer? So if you're 25 and single, you might not wanna have a baby for 10 years. What if you don't meet the right person, right? So they can stay there as long as need be. We don't get freezer burn. It's not like the chicken, okay? <laughs> And uh, they'll be there in the liquid nitrogen. And when you're ready for them, we'll take them out. When you have a partner, we'll fertilize them. And if you've discovered over this process that you have a genetic mutation, when you make an embryo, we'll test it. So we can't test an egg. So if you already knew that you had BRCA coming into your cancer diagnosis and you were going to freeze your eggs, um, I can't test the egg for the mutation. So those eggs will sit there. And unfortunately, we won't know until you make an embryo how many of them have the mutation and how many don't. So in the future, we would find that out when you make the embryo. And so down the road, if you wanted to do the testing, we would fertilize, grow the embryo, do the biopsy of the embryo, and go through that genetic testing for the BRCA. Um, That's helpful. Think, Thanks, Dr. Yeah. Bose. Thank you for clarifying. Great. That's great, thank you. Um, okay, so back to Angelina, thank you. So how about testing men? And this has come up a lot in our prior sessions and I know we think a lot about women when we think about this mutation because it, we pre, the BRCA1 and 2 predisposed to breast and ovarian cancer, but we do know that these mutations can be carried by men and men are at risk of different cancer. So tell us a little bit why it's important to test men and to share with our male relatives if we are a mutation carrier. Definitely. What you tell men who are potentially <laughs> fathers of, of daughters or even sons and what they should do. So let's talk about men. <laughs> right. And it's a very common question that we get with patients. Oh, I thought this just came from my maternal side. And we know that that's not true. Um, these genes typically follow what's called an autosomal dominant form of inheritance, meaning it can be inherited from your mother or your father. It can be passed on to your son or your daughter. And particularly with the BRCA genes, you know, if you hear about them in media or things like that, you know, they're often associated with female breast and ovarian cancer. Those are the first things that people think of um, when in fact, they are also linked to male cancers too, unfortunately. And, you know, if a carrier has brothers, each of those brothers would be at a 50-50 chance of having inherited a mutation. And, you know, oftentimes they think, oh, well, you know, I'm a man, it won't impact me when that's not necessarily true. And particularly if those men have children, it can be passed on to the next generation. So, um, it is really helpful 
for men to get testing if they're interested and if they're able, um, because it's more information for the family and it can also change their cancer screening um, and cancer screening and management recommendations. So can you talk a little bit about what men are at risk of and what options there are? I mean, we I think we all know a lot about screening for breast cancer with MRI imaging and mammography, um, surgical prevention of ovarian cancer, but what about the men? Mm -hmm. So it can depend on which gene we're talking about, but thinking of as an example, BRCA2, we obviously think we know that there's an increased risk for prostate cancer. So for men with BRCA2 mutations, we can start prostate screening younger, usually around 40. They go for a PSA and um, a digital rectal exam every year. Um, so that would be a major change to um, their screening. And also just in terms of the male breast cancer risk, while it isn't crazy high, it's still elevated over, over general population. And at the minimum is we're recommending to family doctors to do an annual uh, chest exam for men, I believe starting at around age 35. And the NCCN has actually, you know, recently updated their recommendations to indicate that men can consider having a mammogram, I believe, starting at age 50. Um, but it's not explicitly recommended. It's just something that can be dis uh, considered and discussed with um, their healthcare provider. Okay, thank you. And of course, it's important for men to talk to their daughters and their and wives and make decisions about uh, potentially passing on this mutation. Because of course, we have seen instances in the clinic that a mutation can come from either, we know it can come from either side of the family, and it's as likely to come from the father than the mother. Mm -hmm. And I just like to add one little thing there, and that is that we do see lots of families that come in where it is the husband that carries the BRCA mutation, and they've seen their mom or their grandma or their sister go through cancer, and they want to make sure their kids don't get cancer. So I would say it's almost 50% of our couples that come in where they've never had cancer, uh, where it's the male partner who has the gene mutation. So people are aware of it, and, and people... Uh, uh, do you want to think about the next generation? Yeah. And sometimes I'll have patients come to me and they're concerned because there's a mutation in their family on their paternal side, and maybe their dad doesn't want testing. And they're, they're wondering, you know, if my dad doesn't get tested, does that mean I can't get tested? And ultimately we can still test those individuals. Um, but it's important to keep in mind you know, even if the children are negative for the mutation, dad could still have it and maybe he just didn't pass it on. So in theory, dad could still be at increased risk for cancer potentially. Yes, thank you. Very important. So many interesting communication um, challenges or opportunities. I think maybe thinking about it both ways within a family. And we know from the literature that sharing genetic test results within families is not optimal. Um, we still see that many families uh, are not receiving when we're thinking about extended relatives. So Angelina, can you just offer a couple of suggestions on how people, it's what we call cascade testing. And that means once one person in the family is tested, how can we cascade that testing out to make sure that all of the at-risk relatives have the opportunity to be tested if they would like? But we know that that's not happening um, in the best case scenario enough of the time. So can you share some strategies with how people can share perhaps with an estranged family member or distance? Often we have families that they're not in contact with their dad's side and they know, you know, the dad has a mutation. How do they share it? So there's so many different issues that, within families. Can you talk a little bit about that? Some strategies, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I find can help a lot, and this is fairly standard across genetics clinics, is if there's a, a mutation that's newly identified in the family, we'll often write up a family letter. Um, it doesn't include anyone's personal health information or identifying info. It'll just be very general, and it'll say, you know, someone in your family recently had genetic testing. They were identified to carry a mutation in this gene. Um, you know, 
take this letter to your doctor to help facilitate the genetic counseling and genetic testing process. And it might include some you know, brief details about the specific cancer risks associated with that gene. So um, I have had concerns from people not wanting to share their personal health info. So, you know, having this um, de-identified family letter, if you will, uh, to kind of distribute to relatives can be really useful. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of getting in contact with estranged relatives, that can that can be tricky. Mm -hmm. um, one thing to remember is it doesn't necessarily have to be all on you to reach out to every single person. Get your family members to help you do that. So maybe you're not in touch with you know that cousin or they live elsewhere, but maybe your sister's in touch with that person or maybe you're in touch with that cousin's sibling um, mm -hmm. and they can kind of help distribute this information or at least let people know um, what's going on. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Angelina. Yeah, communication can be challenging in all families and it's it's hard enough to be dealing with this on your own and then feeling the burden to have to tell your entire family that, you know, could be, could maybe not want to hear about it or even just because of personality reasons, it's hard to communicate. So thank you. Okay, so before we, we go back to Dr. Glass, there was a, a question about um, these videos being available. Just to reiterate, we record all our seminar series and they are all posted on the Women's College Hospital website. So these will all be available for you within, it takes a little bit of time, but we post them every week or every month, sorry, after we do every seminar. So they're all available for you to watch and share with your family. Thanks, Joanne, for that reminder. So I think generally, Dr. Glass, this audience is very concerned with their cancer risk, obviously. Um, most people have been told that they have a, a very high lifetime risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer. So there often, I think, is that concern that if I go for IVF, I'm going to be increasing my chance of developing cancer. You know, you're putting a lot of hormones into me to try and get as many eggs as you can. So can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, is there an increased risk of developing cancer after an IVF? What, what are those kind of things that someone needs to be thinking about to make an informed decision about whether or not to go on and have IVF? And so we actually thought that was a great question. So Joanne and I published a paper five to 10 years ago. So thanks for we need your to update. It's on my list to do. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. So we did look through and how many people are in your database at Women's College of BRSDA one and two carriers? Yeah, over 18,000 now. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. So 18,000 patients. And fortunately, it's a very detailed database. And uh, we looked at all those patients who had ever, you know, never had cancer, had a known mutation, and had ever done any kind of fertility treatment. So whether that was an IUI or IVF. And in that analysis, we did not find an increased risk of ovarian cancer. And these are in people who are at increased risk of ovarian cancer. Um, so we were glad to publish that paper and share that data. Um, there's another paper that came out um, from Israel where there's a very common BRCA mutation that runs in that population. And they did a very similar analysis. So they looked at all these people who had a mutation who had ever done IVF. And it's a great country to do it in because IVF for the entire population is funded by the government there. So it's not just for people who can afford to do it. Um, and so it's very common for people to have IVF. So they had a very large uh, group of patients who had the mutation, never had had cancer, had done IVF, and then they followed them long term. And there was no increased risk of breast or ovarian cancer in that population. So we have some good research to say that. Um, the other thing that's interesting that I did mention and touch on earlier is that if we, even if we look at the population of patients who had breast cancer and went through their IVF cycles, if you literally followed them for years and years and years, like five, 10 years after their diagnosis, the patients who had gone through that IVF cycle, and of course, it, 
you can't randomize, you can't tell people who gets to do IVF and who doesn't. So maybe they were selecting themselves and there's a bias there, but in the patients who were followed a long, long time, like five to 10 years, the patients who had done the IVF cycle actually had less relapses and less recurrences of their breast cancer. And so, you know, I always like to hope that I'm doing a really good thing, giving them that letrozole really early, right? So they come in here for IVF and they're being putting on a breast cancer drug and they're on it for 10 to 12 days before their surgery or their chemo or anything. And maybe that's doing something a little good. I mean, I think we need to keep doing those studies and we need to have a bigger amount of patients to be really confident uh, and to say that. But at least we can feel from that data that we don't think we're doing harm. And that's a very important question to answer. Um, and so it seems like uh, we're okay in that situation with that. So I, I feel comfortable from those studies. Good for people to know when they're trying to make these decisions, I think. And then we are continuing. So many of you are probably participating in these important studies. And we do take the data very, um, we review it very carefully. And this is how we answer some of these questions. And so now that, you know, we, as the numbers increase, we're able to reevaluate and be able to better confirm whether there are any associations with any of these medications. Good. Okay, I have a question for Angelina about partner testing. And so often we would see someone in our clinic um, and really the focus becomes once a uh, mutation is identified like a BRCA2 mutation, once it's identified in, in the woman, we then really focus on her blood relatives. Mm -hmm. We don't often think about the partner, her partner. So can you tell us why we might need to start thinking about that or why, um, why it might be important? Mm -hmm. So for some of these hereditary cancer genes, while they are inherited in an autosomal dominant uh, form, they can also be linked to recessive conditions. Meaning um, if let's say there was a pregnancy and let's say a BRCA2 mutation was passed on not only from one parent, but from both, that means that they would actually have two mutations. And for some genes, if a person is born with a mutation from, from each parent, they can actually have a recessive condition. So with BRCA2, the recessive condition is called Fanconi anemia. It is very rare, but unfortunately it, it can occur. Um, and it's a childhood onset condition where the children have things like bone marrow failure, um, growth defects, increased risks for things like leukemias and lymphomas. So it is a very serious condition. And one thing that we like to highlight if we're disclosing a result to a person who either has um, young children or is thinking of, of having children in the future, if they're a carrier, now explicitly in the, the new OHIP genetic testing criteria, which I think were released about two years ago now, um, the government is covering partner testing for that specific gene. So, um, if a person's a BRCA2 carrier, we can test their partner to see if they are as well. It's very unlikely, but it can happen. Um, and the testing is focused typically on that particular gene. So it's not that we would be testing a partner for you know, a whole large panel. It would be um, focused to that particular gene. So for people who are joining on the call today, what gene should we be thinking about? BRCA2 you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, in rare cases, Fanconi anemia has been linked to BRCA1. Um, also genes like PALB2 um, or uh, I think, I believe RAD51D um, is, is linked to Fanconi. And then with ATM, it's linked uh, recessively to ataxia telangiectasia. So there are a handful of genes um, that are linked to recessive disorders, but not all of them. Okay. So worth a conversation again with your genetic counselor, if this is something that you would like to consider, anybody on the call would like to consider having partner testing, it is covered now and to reach out to your genetics clinic, if that's something you're interested in. Is that what, what we would suggest, Angelina? 
Yeah. Exactly. And at women's, we, we take self-referrals. So oftentimes I'll just have the partner reach out, you know, a couple of weeks later, um, wanting right. to have that done. Um, and, you know, depending on the scenario, if there is a pregnancy that's already happening, we may be able to expedite those results. Okay. Excellent. Um, Angelina, something that you are talking about, kind of going back to the speaking to your children and sometimes individuals come in when they're young and they're not ready to make decisions how are we ensuring or i know it's really hard for you to, it's not your responsibility but how do we try to get the mutation carriers to come back when they're ready for more information or for more guidance on what to do now that they're a mutation carrier and they're approaching the age of screening so once for example maybe you can have a a patient who's 18 who's discovered she's a mutation carrier but you know isn't eligible for screening yet do you just refer her to go to her clinician to in, to ensure that she's enrolled in a screening program do you do you suggest she come back to you after a certain time how is that follow-up being done um there's a couple of different ways you can go about it we're lucky at women's college we have a long-term high-risk uh, breast clinic so we have a team of physicians that can follow these carriers and a suggestion that I will often make to younger women who are mutation positive, but aren't eligible for screening is, you know, let's say we have a 22 year old. Um, perhaps I can refer her on to this high risk breast clinic just to have kind of an introductory appointment with the high risk provider, their name is in the system. They'll be able to at least get familiar with that clinician. And in some cases, the doctor will follow them until they're 30 and afterwards, but not necessarily order imaging, just do kind of like a clinical breast exam. Um, or they may discharge the patient back to the family doctor with the recommendation to re-refer um, at you know, a later age once screening can begin. Okay, thank you. And I know Dr. Kelly Metcalf was also running a study to follow up on women to see if they were ever returning to the high-risk clinics especially when we think about preventative surgery to prevent ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I think we've come to the end of our questions. Thank you for all of those who have participated today, uh, sent in your questions. I think often um, you're not the only person who has that question. So uh, others often have the exact same question as you. So thank you for raising. Dr. Nayrod will be looking at cancer risks associated with genetic mutations, does age matter? And thinking about uh, testing and when testing should be done. So a lot of interesting data that I think he has to present that day. So I would encourage you to register for the next webinar. Please share it with your relatives. We've been talking a lot about family communication today. So please share it with whoever you would like. Anybody is welcome to attend. Um, but on that note, I want to thank you all for attending today and this will be recorded. It has been recorded and we will be posting it up on our website. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Glass and Angelina and have a nice weekend. Everybody enjoy the weather if you're in Ontario. Yeah.